Okay, this is Pastor Peter from the Deland Church of Nazarene. This is our first Wednesday night gathering online instead of on our property. Just want to welcome each of you that are watching uh, live as it's being recorded. And also want to just welcome those who watched it later that weren't able to make it. Uh, we're so glad to have you here tonight. Uh, Pastor Jenny is on staff with me, and she offered and was at my request that she would teach a lesson tonight. So she's going to be our guest teacher sharing with us, and she may call on somebody here to participate along the way. And at some point, I may open up all the lines so that if you want to ask a question and interact, we'll do that toward the end. It is uh, to be under an hour or about an hour, so we're trying not to uh, go too long beyond that and to be sensitive to the viewing capacity of others. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for prayer and turn it over to Jenny. And uh, let's pray together, okay? Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for the technology that you have allowed us to have, that we can hear each other, see each other, and share it with others that are not here in a capacity that propagates the good news of Jesus. And it allows us to be in places later that we couldn't physically be any time or even now. Uh, it really is a miraculous world that we live in, and we know that we live in very turbulent, uh, interesting times to say the least, and we just want to ask you for your healing and protective grace on our families, on us, and, and Lord, we especially pray for the United States of America that you would uh, help our country to be able to unite together to defeat this virus so that we can get back to a life as we once knew it. But until such a time, help us to make the best of different things, this new normal. So bless the word that goes out tonight, the reading of the word, the teaching of the word. Help us to understand in, these, in this season, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. And uh, Jenny, when I mention your name in just a second, I'll, um, I'll, uh, you can begin, okay? So hold on a second. Okay, Jenny, go ahead. You've got the floor, so to speak, or the beach. All right. Thank you. Are you going to mute yourself? <laughs> Never mind. All right, there you go. Uh, welcome, everyone. And this is new to a lot of us, all of us. And so um, it would be nice if you could uh, email or text us or, or in some way communicate to us after we end the meeting of um, anything that you might have as a suggestion, things that you liked, things that were difficult, and uh, maybe it will make it easier for us to do it better the next time. Um, thank you. I am. Uh, Gonna, if you'd like to get out your Bibles, we are going to be taking a look at Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 4 through 14. But, um, and I'm going to be reading some information from a book called Fearless. And it was really appropriate for addressing what's going on in our uh, lives right now around not just our country but around the world. In uncertain times, it's easy to be consumed by fear, anxiety, and hopelessness. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And as we walk this journey together, let us remember that God is not surprised by any of this. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is great, glorious, gracious, and good. May we, without hesitation, find strength and peace in that truth. So um, I'm sure that if you have watched television for much, uh, You've seen advertisements for different medicines. 
Uh, it seems like some evenings my television commercials are just one medicine after another. But there is one thing I could do without the pharmaceutical warnings. I understand that their purpose, but medical manufacturers must be cautious in disclosing every potential tragedy so that when we take their pill, we you know, grow an extra arm or we turn green, uh, we can't sue them. I get that. Still, there is something about the merger of happy faces with voiceover advisories of paralysis that just doesn't work. <laughs> Let's hope that this practice of total disclosure doesn't spill over into the delivery room. <laughs> it might. <laughs> After all, about to be born babies need to know what they're getting into. Pre-birth warnings could likely become standard maternity ward uh, procedures. Can you imagine the scene? Just kind of picture a little bit. A lawyer stands at a woman's bedside. She's panting Lamaze breaths between contractions, and he's reading the fine print of a contract in the direction of her belly. Maybe something like this. Welcome to the post umbilical cord world. Be advised, however, that human life has been known in most cases to result in death. Some individuals have reported experiences with lethal viruses, chemical agents, and or bloodthirsty terrorists. Birth can also result in fatal encounters with tsunamis, inebriated pilots, road rage, famine, nuclear disaster, and or PMS. Side effects of living include super viruses, heart disease, and final exams. Human life is not recommended for anyone who cannot share a planet with evil despots or survive a flight on airplane food. <laughs> now, I know that's a little bit of humor in there, but that's just to, you know, exaggerate the situation. Life is a dangerous endeavor. Uh, we pass our days in the shadows of ominous realities. Today, more than everything ever, it seems like. The power to annihilate humanity has, it seems, been placed in the hands of people who are happy to do so. And I'm referring to like terrorists. Discussions of global attack prompted one small boy to beg, please, mommy, can't we go somewhere there isn't any sky. Mm. If the global temperature rises a few more degrees, if classified information falls into sinister hands, if the wrong person pushes the wrong red button, what if things only get worse? Christ tells us that they will. He predicts spiritual bailouts, the ecological turmoil, and worldwide persecution. Yet, yet, in the midst of it all, he contends bravery is still an option. I'm going to ask Linda to read our scripture. And Linda, just remind us also of what version you're using, please. This is the NIV version. And this is Matthew, once again, 24, 4 through 14. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, 
the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Thank you, Linda. Um, things are going to get bad. And they may get really bad before they get better. And when conditions worsen, this is what Jesus says in verse 6. See to it that you are not alarmed. Jesus chose a stout term for alarmed that he used in no other occasion. It means to wail, to cry loudly, as if Jesus was counseling the disciples, saying, don't freak out when bad things happen. <laughs> what's the difference? And this is something to contemplate. What's the difference between being aware of your situation with rational concern and being alarmed or freaking out? Where is that fine line between being a realist and a cynic? You don't have to answer, but if you would like to contribute, um, Pastor, I'm not sure what they can do to indicate that they want to speak. I think you unmuted everybody, so that would be good in case somebody wants to chime in. All right. Um, so things are going to get really bad. The disciples were making a big to-do. Now, this is before the verses that Linda read. I want to see the setting of um, where Jesus was coming from or, or what was going on at the time before he said uh, these words in the passage. The disciples and he were making a big to-do about and uh, they were really amazed and, and impressed with the massive stones that went into the building, some of them nearly 24 feet long. The followers applauded the awesome structure with its, its variegated marble that resembled the waves of the sea. And Jesus, however, was not so impressed. In fact, in verse 2, he says, Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, can you imagine forecasting the collapse of the White House or Buckingham Palace or the Louvre? Wouldn't you want some details? The disciples said, well, tell us, tell us when these things are going to be. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Certainly, they were curious. I know we're curious too sometimes. And sitting on the Mount of Olives, in full view of the temple in the city of David, Jesus said, buckle your seatbelt, no kidding. Life can get fatal to your health. <laughs> Paraphrased, of course. <laughs> So I want to pose another question to you, and that is, when you think of global disaster, you don't have to think too hard since we're actually going through it. Um, what do you think of global disaster? Do you feel you're being deceived? You know, Jesus began this passage in verse 4. He said, um, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name and claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Um, I will comment on that. I, at first, I began to think there was some deception with fake news and stuff, but the more news that I'm seeing from different parts of the world and putting things together and people that now I know 
who are getting this virus. Um, my son actually told me something from a class he had last night at Olivet. His teacher was teaching about the virus. I, I think it's the real deal. I think even if, um, if it doesn't get as bad as it has in other places for us in Florida, then it is still uh, taking the high road to make sure that it doesn't get as bad as it could versus assuming that it's deception and it's, a, and it's a, got a different motive. Uh, I'm just on the, I've kind of swung my pendulum. That's my comment. Anyone else? I kind of felt that way at first. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with Pastor, and then I've kind of changed my mind, I, you know, but I kind of felt that way at first. I wondered if, you know, well, is somebody make, not making it up, but is it as bad as they're saying? But mm -hmm. now I think pretty much, yes, it is. Thank you for your input there. Um, and Jesus says, don't miss, be misled. That, that's a warning, and we should be. Um, critical to find out and verify what really is the truth. But still with Jesus' comfort in mind. Don't be wooed by those that might claim some fantastic things. Um, sometimes it comes in the form of other leaders even preachers, and he says, don't be fooled or to their slick appearances, their silver-tongued oratory, or their performances. Later in the same sermon, Jesus said, false Christians and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. That was verse 24, the same chapter. Mm -hmm. Multitudes and miracles, large audiences and spectacular deeds, throngs of people, displays of power. When you see them, be careful. High volume doesn't equate with sound faith. Don't be impressed by numbers or tricks. We know. We've been told Satan can counterfeit both. We need to be carefully examining things. False prophets um, always minimize the role of Christ and maximize the role of humanity. Be doctrinally diligent. Stick to one question. Is this person directing listeners to Jesus? If the answer is yes, be grateful and pray for that individual. If the answer is no, mm, I would say get out while you can. It's not of God. Along with heresy, we can expect calamity. That's what Jesus has foretold. And Linda read it in verses 6 through 8. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginnings of birthing plans, birthing pains. See, um, I think that we have, in our lifetimes, already been witness to some of these things. We're not sure what scale Jesus was talking about that really marked the end of the time that's coming. But I hear about in the news about wars in different areas of the, of the world, also earthquakes where you wouldn't have expected earthquakes, and the people residing there didn't expect them either. Floods, tsunamis, you know, we know all these disasters do occur on the earth. But it seems to me, and I don't know if it's because they are more frequent or if we just have such a 
uh, global news going on that we are hearing about them more often, but it seems like there is more and more of these types of occurrences. Christians, Jesus said, will suffer the most. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Wow, that's a sobering prediction. Something that we should keep close as time goes on and these things start to happen and we see more and more people rise to um, levels that they are really preaching their own thing. Um, we need to live somewhere in between the Pollyanna and the Chicken Little. <laughs> in other words, we need to be level-headed and clear thinking and not, you know, be blind, but we need to be level thinking and still believing followers of Christ who will bring others to focus on God in this time of tragedy. What I want to ask another question, just put it out there. Are you on the front lines in the defense of Christianity? Or has your love for God grown cold? That's just something that you have to um, think it through, pray through, and let the Spirit reassure you or convict you. I think I'm still, still with him, and uh, I find comfort in these verses. I think that uh, one thing that's obvious here is that he's talking about the temple and the stones when he starts out. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's missing right now is the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would think we'd see some effort to start rebuilding the third temple in Jerusalem because we, we don't need it, but prophecy needs it. Mm -hmm. in order for the man of perdition to put his image in that temple. Mm -hmm. And that marks the halfway point of the tribulation period. So until we see some effort to start building that temple and restart the sacrifices, um, you know, the animal sacrifices, that we, we can be pretty assured the end is not yet. I think that's what he's saying. And he even says, I don't know if it has it in that uh, Bible that you're reading, but in uh, verse 15, he talks about looking at Daniel, and he says, Whoso readeth, let him understand. And if you look at Daniel, there's a verse in there that explains the timeline uh, from the time the sacrifices are stopped. And the uh, image is put in the temple. And that gives you an idea that, first of all, the sacrifices have to start up again. We don't even have a temple. So we can't end the sacrifices if they haven't started. So that gives me comfort in thinking that time's not yet. But we will see this other stuff. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff. But the... But yeah. also it's known that the first half of the tribulation period is a good time. And the second half is the worst. So that's some comfort there. That's my two cents. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, um, yes, Jane. Um, that scripture you read, the love of many will grow cold. It's kind of scary when you want to stop and think about a Christian's love growing cold. I think we need, that's why we need to really work at loving each other more. Yes. Yes. I agree. That's a very good point. And we need to also continue to support each other 
in our faith. Um, that is the support group that Jesus designed, that God designed in us, is that we are relational beings. And when we start either getting cut off or isolating ourselves is when I believe that we are more susceptible to these deceptions and that growing cold. Um, when we have encouragers around us and we can be encouragers to others, I think is, is part of the support that we need to um, provide and, and, and accept from fellow Christians. Because it is, it's bad times. And uh, yeah, I agree with Dave that the time is not yet. And there are things that scripture tells has to come in and be in place and happen uh, before the end comes. And we don't know when that end is. We don't know how soon or how far away it is. And sometimes we recognize things happening in the world and we misinterpret them slightly when we try and put God within our time box and, and put God in a box and say, oh, this is what's happening. And then it doesn't because it really isn't God's time yet. But uh, we do need to continually be aware but not overcome by uh, um, like Chicken Little. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. You know, he was all in an uproar, and all it was was an acorn. Um, and then again, on the opposite side, we can't be the Pollyanna that is, oh, everything's all good and fine and happy and dandy and positive. And no, we have to have reality checks. And um, I, I think this is part of why Jesus spoke to his disciples in this way. To, to give them um, truth and also reality checks through whatever we happen to be um, experiencing and going through either, you know, in our country or in the world. Um, However, I was just going to say, I do yeah. see God's hand in, in, in this whole situation that we have today. Mm -hmm. I see his hands working with us. And yeah. bringing us, you know, in other words, it's like a guiding hand, right, on the, on the world and on us. And, and it, that, I take comfort in that. Yes. Mm hmm You know, a lot of times um, the, the church in America has a reputation for expecting Christians to always be positive, but Jesus was brutally honest and then his description of terrible things to come. So we, we need to keep a good perspective. Mm -hmm. um, persecution is something that he also talked about in this passage. Um, he, he said Christians will suffer the most. Uh, it over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me at that time many will turn away from the faith and betray betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold so are you either personally or close to you experiencing any kind of persecution because of your faith, your Christianity. Only when Kingdom Hall comes to the door. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Actually, I think in, in, a, in a sense, we're all being persecuted by the situation that we're in today and, what, and what's going on with, with here it's it is a it's a form of persecution yeah this, this illness that has come on us and and being spread throughout the land 
somebody, well, here's... Somebody, somebody had texted there. I, I had to, it was kind of interesting the other day saying that, you know, they, they thought this was the second Passover. So I said, well, what are we supposed to put over the doorposts? <laughs> <laughs> A sacrificial lamb's blood. <laughs> you you mentioned the fact about uh, being asking if we were being sacrificed or our religion is. Uh, I don't not spiritually. I'm not. But when you have family members out there that won't listen, that were brought up in the church and won't listen to what the word says or what you're trying to get across to them, that to me is being persecuted in a way. Yes. Um, America, as proud as she is of religious freedom, uh, we suffer from increasing anger towards Christians. Professors publicly mock Bible-believing students. Talk show hosts denigrate people of faith. We can expect the persecution to increase. When it does, sometimes fragile convictions will start to collapse persecution will increase and that's what i think jesus meant by saying that the love of many will grow cold spiritual stowaways will jump ships the half-hearted will become cold-hearted a great many church attenders will be disclosed as faith pretenders they will not only leave the faith, but they will make the lives of the faithful miserable. We have to actively, um, as much as our country will allow it, uh, do things to preserve our religious freedom, but know that it may not be so all the time, that we may come under um, a heavier persecution at some time. Pastor? Yeah, I was trying to be polite and raise my hand. Uh, <laughs> I, as, as we were discussing this verse, I, um, I, I am reminded as much as there's a today context for everything, like the love of, of many will grow cold, it was also written to a first century church, which means that any Christian in any century can have these same predicaments because um, I believe it was relevant to the first century and I believe it's relevant to now. And I can only imagine when Europe was faced with the bubonic plague and there was, there was millions of people dying in a far more gruesome scenario than what we are yet yes. experiencing. And they probably thought this is the end, and yet we're now 500 plus years beyond that worldwide plague. So I, I think it's the mystery of scripture always leaves us on the edge of this could be his return. And, uh, and I think it's appropriate that we live on the edge like that, but every generation has done that as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we also need to be hopeful and in the sense that we may get through this difficult time and we can have a great season of prosperity and, 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 and conversions and, and people come to Christ in droves and droves and, and a revival. I, I don't, I, I guess I'm still seeing the possibility of, of, of a flourishing world coming to Christ than just um, the love of everybody getting cold and, uh, and it becoming just hard. Um, we all got different perspectives, but just throwing my two cents in. So now between Dave and I, we have four cents in the pot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep them yeah, going. you make a good point. And uh, I, I agree. We can see it as an opportunity for a great revival and a spiritual um, awakening. possibility, but we also cannot ignore the words of Jesus and be cautious. I mean, even if we have a great awakening and many profess to have faith in, in Jesus, um, that doesn't guarantee that their hearts are right. It does mean that their words 
are there. And I, I think this is somewhat what Jesus was alluding to, or could be, that although there are professing believers, even in that time, um, some of them may fall away because they weren't deep enough or strong enough or had the support system enough to, to encourage and build up and, and help disciple and mature them. Absolutely. So I, I think there's going to be all kinds. I don't believe, I really don't believe that it's going to be like a, a mass exodus of the Christian faith. No, I, I believe that there will be some that, that do exit. And, uh, but there, I believe, will always have a good contingent of, of true faith believers and, and that continue on the work of Christ. Um, it's, it's got to, even through um, everything that we might live through as a um, believing Christians, not just in our own lifetime, but those that will come after us, I think that it will still continue. Um, and, I, and I think, I think the, um, my concern as a pastor, but not just as a pastor, as a believer, even if I weren't a pastor, is we need each other and we need to stay connected. Now, even before we hit this plague, if you would, uh, many people had already chosen or were very indifferent about being well connected to the body of Christ, even yes. though they were Christians professingly. And, you know, in the first century, you know, they met daily or as often as they met, they worshiped the Lord. And, and so I'm hopeful that maybe this isolation thing will create in many Christians who really truly have a good relationship with the Lord. I need my brothers and sisters. And that's my hope. And, but, but I also believe Satan could drive a wedge here and weaken yeah. people and it, they may, they may not return in many churches mm -hmm. across our nation. It's just hard to know. We, that's why I think using these tools for, staying connected and on the phone, on, on our computers, on our video, as much as we rather be in person, they're essential to stay connected, inspired, and encouraged. Oh, yes, I agree. Yes, thank you. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. We have, we have already seen, though, a huge falling away from just the people across our own nation that, that mm -hmm. uh, I know everybody here knows people that used to come to church and then don't anymore. And, and then they've just gone in a different direction. Right. I know my own family it's happened. So, yeah, it, um, it can happen and we don't know how close to us it, or far already... away from us. Mm -hmm. Now, will this persecution come to us? Well, <laughs> I think certainly. For some of you, it already has. For many of us, it might. If we're thrown into jail for our faith or deposed for our convictions, may God help you and me to remember the counsel of Christ. He says again in verse 6, see to it that you are not alarmed. And, and that alarm is a strong word. But it's not to overtake us. Don't freak out at the heresy. Don't freak out at the calamity or the apostasy. Don't give in or give up. For we are promised you'll soon see the victory. In verse 13 and 14, he says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus was equipping his followers with far-sighted courage. He listed what you might say the typhoons of life, and then he pointed them to the end. Trust in ultimate victory gives ultimate courage. I like that. Trust in ultimate victory gives ultimate courage. Hmm. 
how can you remind yourself that God is in control? What do you do to remind yourself that God is in control? Pray a lot. <laughs> really pray. Look in the word. I do. That's what I do. I think you can look at prophecy. I don't know if my mic's on. Yes. But yeah, f fulfilled prophecy is a good example of God being in control because you can see the plan unfolding. That, that's good. Keep in the word because the word gives us everything that we need in order to weather the current storms. Mm -hmm. And past examples in scripture are wonderful. They may not be the precise same um, happenings or situations, but they certainly do have the precepts and still show that God is in control. And it doesn't really matter whether he uses his ambassadors, his followers, his Christians, his children, or he may also use the uh, the pagan, the the you know the people that are t totally unbelievers, because we have seen that in the past in how he does work things together regardless of who the players are. That's a good one. And then, you know, praying. Um, when we truly pray in the spirit and in tune with God, scripture again promises that we will get a confirmation between his spirit and our spirit. And it can be encouraging. Any other ideas of um, how you remind yourself that God is in control? You can see in, in situations where the hand of God is just so present. I mean, it, it, to me anyway, I can see I can see the hand of God when when uh, when someone's prayed for and and they get over the illness very quickly. I mean, we just had an incident yes. where there was a, a pastor at Port Orange who was sick in the hospital, and the doctor said, "You better come see him because he won't last the weekend." Well, uh, Pastor Vince went out there with his wife, and they prayed and prayed and prayed over it. And he w then he went home and got a call the next morning at 11 o'clock that he's sitting up in bed, he's fine, and now he's going to be going home next week. So you see, it, the hand of God is just so present in that kind of a situation. Yeah. The, the, I think one, that, one that, more. That's also encouraging. One Jane? way that I, one way I have seen God's hand is, keeping me from accidents several times i could have you know turned when i shouldn't have turned or I'm out in front of me and i wasn't watching and the, mm -hmm. the lord has really watched over me in those times had that one too definitely yeah, yeah. many yeah. times i think that being aware and uh, being sensitive to the things and sometimes i know like in my life I don't always know it at the time, but thinking over in retrospect, how, how did this situation come about? Uh, I know it must have been the hand of God that was involved and in either guiding or protecting or, or showing me something else. And, but that, that's a good way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think that's how the Holy Spirit shows us, you know, um, educates us and shows us. That's the best way. Excuse me. Yep, somebody's ringing. <laughs> um, well, you were talking too about being in prison. You know, we have one man in our church that that's where he got saved was in jail, mm -hmm. and it just shows the Lord is working everywhere. That's right. There's there's nothing that binds him to a particular location because God is everywhere and he can work everywhere and anywhere he, he chooses. And 
Yeah, that is wonderful. When we can look at those, then that does give us some more courage. It does give us some reinforcement that truly God is in control and we can trust in him no matter what's happening in our individual lives or in the lives of those around us. Yes, we may be an instrument of his to um, extend uh, whatever it is, encouragement, um, love, care, you know, it, it's a lot of different ways. I know I take walks around my neighborhood every day, and some days I'm quiet and listening, and other days I'm actively praying, um, and then many times God just gives me an awareness of something that is just beautiful or unusual and and something that is serendipitous and and i just say wow you know yeah. i know that god is here because that this doesn't happen by coincidence <laughs> this this happens because of god mm -hmm. Okay, Donna, I see your hand raised. Thank you for showing us that feature so we can use that in the future. Oh, wait a minute. Can't uh, hear you, Donna. Can't hear you. She is unmuted. Okay, Donna, apparently the sound is not working on your device. Yeah, in case, in case somebody wants to know by pushing, you know, um, the menu at the bottom where it says more, you hit the button on, it says more and it comes up and one of the choices on that menu is raise hand. Yeah, that's very, I, I appreciate learning about that because um, this, this is a feature that we can use instead of unmuting everybody, we can keep everybody muted and they can raise their hand, but I'm not sure everybody's gonna have the same function depending on what device they use. But yeah, I'm on a computer and I just discovered that. So thank you, George, and thank you, Donna. But Donna, do you have a, a question that you're able to voice yet? We're not hearing you. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if everyone has the ability to use the chat feature I know I'm on a computer, so I can see a little icon at the bottom that says chat, and then I can type in, and um, that way, you know, we could see it. If you have right, a question, so if your audio is not working. Unless she's got it muted on her end, we can't tell. That may be a possibility. Chat um, feature doesn't seem to be on the phone. So this is the first time I'm on. I didn't know if it might be under more. No, it's not. It's not. Well, it's not there. I see okay. It. We we need to probably begin to wrap up here shortly. Uh, mm -hmm. Donna, if you want to type in your question, even though we can't hear you, uh, we'd be glad to wait a moment, and maybe you can open your chat box if you got it. But I'm just not sure. Uh, but you can always you can always ask the question later. Well, we can answer it online later, or in person on the phone, whatever. Um, but Jenny, great. Um, discussion tonight I think is very appropriate uh, right down the down the center of where we're all at praise God and um, do you want to call on someone to wrap up in prayer as we or do you, are you done I should say that are you done Jenny I just want to leave everyone with one thing okay. and I think it pretty well summarizes things uh, especially when we might be anxious about things that are going on um, <laughs> There's um, a friend that said, everything will work out in the end. If it's not working out, it's not the end. Romans 8 to 8. Yes. <laughs> and what about Psalm 37, 7? Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Amen. No. Scripture's full of these wonderful um, reassurances, and um, sometimes 
I call it a correction to my thinking <laughs> because sometimes I don't think quite right and I need to be straightened out and scripture is there. And that's wonderful. I just want to thank George for letting me know about this and I appreciate you all and your efforts to get out this message and I've enjoyed it a lot. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dave. It was a pleasure having you and the input. And uh, I, I want to know that... what, beach, what beach you're at. That's what I want to know. <laughs> She's in Hawaii. Okay. Oh, that's wacky key. <laughs> okay. I got to tell you just a little bit about the background, okay? <laughs> um, I was supposed to leave on a two-week vacation in Hawaii tomorrow. And since... That, of course, has all been canceled. I figured um, maybe I'll just, you know, think about being on that Hawaiian beach and on a cruise. So, therefore, I've got the background <laughs> thinking and, and just pretending that I might be on the beach. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's, let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. All right. Uh, and, and if you want to wrap up in prayer, Jenny or somebody, sure. 